As a cultural anthropologist, I'm obsessed with what makes human beings tick. I'm equally fascinated by the differences and similarities between cultures and those within a culture. So when I began hearing stories about a self-identified hillbilly artist in the hills outside of Addison, I felt compelled to learn more. And what I learned took me into a world I didn't know existed and one I want to share with you today. Some of our neighbors in the southern tier are making a living from an informal, gray market economy they call picking and scrapping. First, some definitions. Picking is working a territory, finding valuable items to sell through a network of specialized collectors, junk shops, and flea market vendors. Scrapping is getting trash and breaking it apart into component pieces to sell. It's a gray market economy because while it runs parallel to the black market economy of illegal drugs or contraband cigarettes and alcohol, what pickers and scrappers sell is not actually illegal. But the distribution network is unregulated and untaxed, and the money they earn often augments welfare or disability payments and goes unrecorded. Some people in the middle class also engage in these informal economies, but they don't make their primary livelihood that way. When we think of people who make their primary living by selling other people's trash, we generally think of deeply impoverished people in third world countries. But there's a population of people in the southern tier who are economically dependent on selling our refuse, and many of them are retired or disabled. When we hear about the poor in the United States, they are sometimes described as somehow lesser, less well-educated, less ambitious. But the picking and scrapping economy is sophisticated. Pickers have a keen eye for aesthetics, and scrappers have a clear sense of economic value. Though their aesthetic sense and their economic values can vary significantly from that of the middle class. I want to tell you how I learned about this economy and why I think it's important. In 2007, I began working as a folklorist at the Arts Council of the Southern Finger Lakes, and several people in the community came to me about a reclusive artist named Amos Oakton who had recently died. His artwork had been left behind in the shack that he lived in, which was a one-room schoolhouse. This was very primitive. It lacked electricity. It lacked toilet facilities. It lacked running water. Amos would drink from a drainage ditch that went along the front of his property. He told his friend that he knew the drainage ditch was safe to drink from when the frogs were in it. If the frogs avoided it, so did he. He would bathe in a stream near his home. This stream was cold in August. I asked his friend. How could he bathe in this in February? She said, "He didn't." <laughs> he warmed his house with a wood stove. He kept chickens. I don't know if Amos was a hunter, but he had a bow and a、uh, gun in the house. And I was told he had a poorly preserved deer head on which he had practiced homestyle taxidermy. Amos was an eccentric. On a hot summer night, he would take a battery-operated amplifier outside of his shack and sing a cappella gospel music. His neighbors reported hearing his voice ringing through the hills. Amos was disabled. He fell on a roofing job, but even before the fall, he was only intermittently employable. He drank too much. He was probably an alcoholic. He was possibly mentally ill. He was, at the very least, shall we say? Socially unusual. No matter how well a person knew him, if they came to his door, he greeted them with a shotgun. There were two things that Amos could do. Amos was a scrapper, and Amos was an artist. It was his artwork that compelled community members to come to me, because it had been left behind in his house. And the house had now become a site for kids to party, so the community was concerned that the artwork would be lost through vandalism or theft. But I wasn't sure there was anything I could do about this. Then, in 2009, a woman came to me with a piece of his artwork on scrap veneer, painted with magic marker, and she said, "Do you think this is worth saving?" 
I looked at the piece with its mythical beast, its religious symbols, and I thought it was hauntingly beautiful. I said, yes, this is worth saving. She said, well, you better do it or it's going to be destroyed. A week later, a team of us went to Amos's house and we rescued all the artwork we could take. And it's a good thing we did, because three months later, the shack burned to the ground. Because of the efforts of people in the community, you can see Amos's artwork, which will be on display at 171 Cedar Arts Center in Corning from January through March 2014 in an exhibit called Salvaged, Outsider Art in the Southern Tier. But we weren't able to save all of Amos's artwork because he literally painted on the walls. So when the house burnt down, so did a lot of this art. Um, Amos painted on scrap, misshapen pieces of two by four, plywood, firewood, his bedpost, the face of a dresser drawer. It was the scrap of the scrap. But I didn't know why he used this material until another outsider artist came into the Arts Council. This man calls himself Holy Moses. Holy Moses, oh, just on a chance, we asked him if he knew Amos. He not only knew Amos, he owned some of Amos's artwork because Moses is a picker and Amos was a scrapper and their territories overlapped, but because they had different functions in the economy, they had a cooperative relationship instead of a competitive one. Like Amos, Moses works on scrap. Like Amos, Moses is disabled. He fell on a job. Like Amos, Moses is eccentric. He calls himself Holy Moses. He also, he also, his plan for the summer was to sleep in a van uh, without electricity or running water on a small piece of property in Steuben County. And he is already in his 60s, and he already suffers a painful disability. Moses agreed to take me around and introduce me to people who knew Amos. Getting into the car that day with a stranger to drive through uncharted territory in Steuben County was a little bit spooky. But Moses not only introduced me to the friends and neighbors of Amos, he also introduced me to the world of picking and scrapping. Moses is a hard worker. No matter how much pain he is in, he feels he has to earn some money every week. He educates himself. He reads books and magazines about antiques, Native American artifacts, and local history. Moses will work his territory and he will literally knock on doors based purely on gut instinct. If he finds an item of value, he sells it through a distribution network of specialized collectors, many of whom own junk shops or are flea market vendors. Moses also described for me the world of scrapping. So for several days, we drove through western Steuben County while he described wading into stream beds to pull out returnable bottles, aluminum cans, or if he got really lucky, machine parts. Scrappers break apart trash and sell their component pieces. They'll scrap anything. They'll take apart computers for copper wires. They'll sell scrap pipe, scrap lumber, I know a man who was disabled on a job who began sawing apart trailers. But as you might imagine, it's a hard living and dangerous. Scrappers are exposed to toxic chemicals. And it takes hours of backbreaking labor to take apart a trailer. So the only people who have the motivation or the time to do this are unemployed. And they're unemployed because they're disabled. So they're already in pain before they begin sawing apart that trailer or wading into a stream bed for an aluminum can. One of the biggest problems that scrappers face is that they lack reliable transportation. So sometimes they'll build uh, flat carts or homemade carts that they'll pull on their bicycle, or they simply put the scrap into large plastic bags and carry it over their shoulders. I met two scrappers who were working the state park system, and they were just carrying the scrap on their shoulders through the trails. They had a plan. 
They waited till after a hard rain because it would pop the recycled bottles up out of the holes underneath the falls and push them into the shallow stream beds where they're more easily collected. Just the other night, on my residential street in Corning, I saw a man pulling a load of scrap on a homemade cart behind his bicycle. His face, his teeth, his body showed his poverty. If I showed you this man's image in a third world country, we would be here talking about micro grants for cottage industry. But when we see this man in the United States, we don't think of him as hardworking or noble. We think of him as strange, possibly dangerous, at the very least embarrassing, like some off kilter relative. I don't want to romanticize his life. I don't think any one of us would trade in our lives and become pickers and scrappers full time. And I don't know any picker or scrapper who wouldn't move into the middle class if they thought they could be an engineer or a nurse. But I do want to say one thing the rural poor in the United States are resilient, they are innovative, they are entrepreneurial, they are not victims of their lives. Their wounded bodies, their illnesses, or their poverty. And they are creative. We share that part of human nature that compels us to express ourselves through art. We don't even know what's being made in the hills around us. Remember that the next time you take a drive in those hills. <laughs>